I believe the, di the discovery of endogenous hallucinogens is one of the great unheralded discoveries of mankind. And the discovery of endogenous morphine-like compounds uh, was awarded the Nobel Prize. My experience with this field has been that the discovery of hallucinogens has not been given anywhere near the attention that it deserved. That this, these compounds, known hallucinogens, can be naturally synthesized in the body of man. And knowing what they do when they're administered from the outside get, gives us such a great opportunity to study the natural mechanisms for perhaps the regulation of perception itself. These compounds appear to be produced at fairly low levels, but that's based on our peripheral measurements. And as I've discussed, those levels may have little to do with the actual levels that are obtained in discrete brain areas. We have to keep in mind that when these compounds are manufactured in specific neurons, they are uh, placed into small vesicles and stored at the end of the neuron at a synaptic cleft between other neurons where it would be used as a signaling molecule. The concentration of the uh, compound at the synaptic cleft can be extremely high. And the only way you can replicate that is by injecting large doses to get enough into the brain to produce an effect. So exactly what the concentrations are in these discrete areas may lead to very low uh, level measurements in the periphery. Uh, nonetheless, they may be very concentrated in certain tissues in the brain, perhaps the pineal. Uh, understanding where these compounds might be located and how they function will allow us then to determine what their role may be. There was a study published in 1978 by uh, Dr. Christian in people in the University of Alabama and Birmingham Neuroscience Program laboratory that characterized dimethyltryptamine as a neurotransmitter. It meets all the criteria you know, for a neurotransmitter. The precursors are there. The enzymes are there to synthesize it. It uh, can be taken up into vesicles. It can be released from vesicles in the brain. It has electrophysiological activity. It can cause a signal to be sent between neurons. Add to that the fact that it can be actively transported into the brain from the periphery and that there are enzymes in the periphery that are also capable of synthesizing those compounds. And you have a scenario where you can start to see possibilities given what its effects are on perception as to what the role of this compound may be. Uh, work by Dr. Robert Harrison in the same neuroscience program at UAB that was unfortunately never published but still sits in his dissertation at the library uh, at the University of Alabama in Birmingham uh, demonstrated that if you place rats in a stressful situation by either swimming stress where they have to swim to find a safe place to get out of the water in a paradigm designed to create stress in the animal, or in isolation stress where you actually put the animal into a small container, something quite medieval it would seem and almost like torture, but this is how stress was induced in animals back in the 1980s, in the late 1970s, that those stressful conditions greatly elevated the levels of DMT in the brain and in the adrenal glands, which are organs that respond sit just above the top of the kidney, that uh, organs that respond to stress you know, by releasing a number of different hormones. Well, this indicates that you know, DMT may have some role in a response to stress and thus changes that may occur from the periphery you know, in brain tissue in response to those events. Uh, DMT has cardiovascular effects and it can stimulate heart rate, it can cause vasoconstriction. These are things that you know, are very helpful in a fight or flight type phenomenon where you want to protect yourself, increase heart rate, uh, cause vasoconstriction so that if you're injured on, on the outside that you don't bleed as much, uh, but at the same time stimulate the brain you know, to perhaps be more creative. And at the same time there may be uh, increases in the release of 
these compounds in response to uh, other uh, peripheral phenomena that are occurring in that stress response, many of which Dr. Strassman measured. He, he showed dramatic changes in cortisol and other stress-related compounds, as well as a great increase in endorphin molecules, molecules that can relieve the effect of pain. Right? And, and again, this seems to be a fight-or-flight type response. That data was unfortunately never published uh, because Dr. Harrison died right after his dissertation was defended. And the, uh, his major professor, unfortunately, never saw uh, a way to get it published. And he also demonstrated uh, in some research that he and I worked on together, Dr. Uh, Harrison and I worked on together, uh, that if we administered amphetamine chronically to uh, rats, that it increased the level of dimethyltryptamine in brain and adrenal gland. And one of the more interesting experiments that we did uh, that unfortunately we never got to complete because of uh, Dr. Harrison's death and because of the failure of the laboratory to continue to receive funding from the National Institutes of Mental Health was when we administered LSD to uh, rats, we saw a tenfold increase in the level of endogenous 5-methoxydimethyltryptamine and a fourfold increase in dimethyltryptamine. This suggests that there is a endogenous hallucinogen neuronal system and that many hallucinogens may not actually be true hallucinogens but endogenous hallucinogen neuronal system agonists, that they stimulate the release of these endogenous hallucinogens which then carry out their uh, function and on perception.